Hello and welcome to our special broadcast. I'm Parikshit Lutra. It is election day in the United States. The polls are open. America is choosing its next president and the race is too close to call. Donald Trump and Kamala Harris are neck and neck as millions of Americans head to polling booth to cast their votes. The road to the White House would go via the seven swing states. That accounts for 93 electoral college votes. Pennsylvania, with the highest number of electoral college votes among the swing states, could hold the key to the White House. No Democrat since 1948 has won an election without winning Pennsylvania. About 83 million people have already cast an early ballot. This is higher than uh, 53 million early ballots cast in 2016. This number crossed 100 million in 2020, but that was largely driven by the COVID-19 pandemic. Another interesting point is the increase in the number of women casting an early vote, which now stands at 55%. This is higher than the two previous elections. To take this forward, I'm now joined by former Indian ambassador to the US, Meera Shankar, the Washington Post political reporter, Patrick Swetik, and Sean Trent, senior election analyst at Real Clear Politics. Uh, Patrick, let me begin by asking you, what are the two main figures in American politics today, Kamala Harris and Donald Trump, doing on the election day? Are they going to be visiting different swing states? What are their priorities going to be? How is their day going to pan out? You know, today they're mostly hunkering down at their home bases, Donald Trump uh, in Florida, Kamala Harris in Washington. Uh, Kamala Harris is scheduled to do radio interviews, um, so she will be, you know, talking to swing state voters virtually. And then her running mate, uh, Tim Walls, is scheduled to make one last stop in Pennsylvania in person, uh, which Pennsylvania has become just an absolutely crucial state in this race. So those are their plans for today. All right. Uh, and Sean, uh, good to have you back on CNBC TV 18. The race is extremely close as we're in the final lap, as the early voting has begun. What state are you actually looking out for? Well, thanks for having me back. And I've been doing this 20 years. This is the closest election I have ever had to evaluate. I think the key to this election is the state you mentioned. It's Pennsylvania. It's the largest of the swing states, and it's also been the closest in the polling averages. I think whoever wins Pennsylvania has a very, very good chance of becoming the next president of the United States. Right. Uh, coming to you, Ambassador Mira Shankar, uh, do you feel the demographics right now, the trends emerging out of the United States, are they in favor of Kamala Harris, or do you think that somewhere there is an underlying current in favor of Donald Trump? Well, it's very difficult to say because, uh, you know, uh, the race is so tight uh, that uh, it could go either way. I think it's too close to call and a lot hinges on the outcome of the seven swing states, particularly Pennsylvania, which is in a dead heat. It has 19 electoral college votes. And since it's tied, it could flip either way. Um, I think gender clearly is an issue in this election because it's the first election since the Supreme Court overturned uh, Roe v. Wade, which had given the right of abortion to women. And uh, many states have since reversed uh, abortion rights or restricted them. And therefore, this is panning out to be a, an issue of key concern amongst women. So there is, a, there is a gender divide in the supporters of the two candidates. Uh, yes, uh, minorities have traditionally voted with the Democratic Party. But uh, again, surprisingly, there seems to be a little bit of a gender divide, let's say, even amongst minority voters. Um, again, education becomes uh, a marker because university-educated uh, voters are more likely to vote Democratic. Non-university-educated voters are more likely to vote with Trump, particularly white non-university-educated voters. But at the moment, as right. I said, race is in a dead heat. Um, I don't mm. think there's anything definitive which would allow you to say X is going to win or Y is going to win. 
All right. Uh, Patrick, if I were to come to you, there are many people analyzing Trump's final speeches, and they say that he's possibly hinting at uh, some sort of defeat. Uh, is that something that you are reading in uh, the speeches of Donald Trump? Is that the sense that one gets after speaking to the Republican camp? Well, I think he's made some statements that, you know, acknowledge the obvious reality that this is a very close race and it could go either way. And one of those scenarios could be defeat. I don't know if I'm personally reading too much into that in terms of the outcome uh, he's expecting. Uh, but there certainly have been statements by him or people affiliated with his campaign acknowledging just how tight this race is. Um, and I think both candidates are just absolutely um, exhausted. I mean, this has been a, a more tumultuous presidential race than is typical for the United States, just given the historic or near historic events that we've seen, whether it's the uh, assassination attempt against Trump, the uh, changeover in the Democratic nominee late this summer. And so I think both sides are just, um, you know, absolutely exhausted as we reach the finish line here. Right. Uh, Sean, returning to you, today, when it is the final election day, we have been reporting how close to 85 million Americans have already voted in an early vote. So who are the likely people coming out today in large numbers? Is it the undecided voter? Is it the younger American? Uh, who is it, according to you? Well, the early vote in America uh, is something that's historically uh, skewed towards Democrats, but this time Republicans have really emphasized it. So we don't really know what election day is going vote is going to look like because so many Republicans uh, have decided to turn out early this time. Typically, though, the people who turn out on Election Day are people who hadn't made up their minds, um, because when you make up your mind, you're more willing to go in and cast that ballot early. So these are the proverbial swing voters, the, the four or five percent of the electorate who has been telling pollsters all along that they don't know who they're going to vote for. Today is the day that they make up their mind and likely swing the outcome of the election one way or the other. Right. Uh, what's happening in uh, Pennsylvania, according to you, Patrick? Why is this still a uh, dead heat? There is no clarity on who's winning Pennsylvania right now. This is a state, it's literally a blue wall for Democrats. Yeah, well, it has 19 uh, it has electoral votes and, uh, you know, demographically, geographically, um, it has a pretty... Uh, you know, healthy mix. I mean, it has uh, major cities. It has suburbs that have been shifting toward Democrats in recent history. It has large rural working class areas that have been shifting toward Donald Trump in recent elections. And so if you just look at the political landscape in that state, um, I think it's fair to say that you know, it provides opportunities for both parties that are consistent with the opportunities they've had over the past few elections to uh, grow their support in, in unique and distinct ways. Right. Uh, Mira Shankar, if I were to ask you right now, what's the kind of impact this election will have on the two wars that we see right now? The Ukraine-Russia war, Israel, and uh, tomorrow we could possibly see a full-blown conflict between Israel and Iran as well. So be it the Middle East, be it uh, uh, Russia, Ukraine, where do you think the next president will have his, his or her biggest challenges? Uh as far as President, um, uh, Vice President Harris is concerned, she has said she will continue to support Ukraine and help Ukraine to attain victory in the war with Russia. Um, President Trump uh, did not answer when asked whether he would you know, support Ukrainian victory, but said he would work to end the war. So his priorities have been different, and uh, you could expect efforts towards uh, perhaps cutting back on aid to Ukraine and uh, also commencing some negotiations towards ending the conflict. Uh, of course, much will depend on the composition of the House and the Senate, in terms of how much of a free hand he has in this. And it's also possible that the Democrats, after the election, may move after a period of time 
to look at possibilities of how this war could end, because it's quite clear it's not ending on the battlefield. And, uh, you know, Ukrainian lives are being lost and a lot of uh, aid is going from Western countries to support Ukraine. So at some stage, I presume that there will have to be a willingness to see how this conflict could perhaps be halted on both sides, though I think the Democrats will not do it um, initially. They might come to it after a period of time because they have vowed to continue their existing policies. Trump has definitely said he will seek to end the war. So we can expect a shift as far as the US policies towards Ukraine are concerned. Uh, All right. We are going to be taking a break. Uh, we're going to be taking a short break here, Ambassador Mira Shankar, but we'll be right back. We have to discuss a lot more on what's happening in those key swing states and how have recent comments by Kamala Harris and Donald Trump been taken by the electric? We'll come to all of that in just a bit. Welcome back. Uh, we are uh, analyzing the early voting in the United States. Lots at stake in this election for both Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. Let's go across to Washington Post uh, political reporter Patrick Switek once again. Uh, Patrick, if we were to look at the numbers coming out of the swing states, it's quite possible that we may not have a result by tomorrow morning or by late today evening. Uh, if we were to look at US time, what is the sense that you get from both the camps? Is there a possibility of a legal challenge being thrown in? Are both the teams getting their uh, legal counsels together? Yeah, look, I think both both sides um, have lawyers at the ready um, for the aftermath of, of polls closing, whatever that may bring. Um, in terms of the timeline, you know, Kamala Harris's campaign, I think, has been especially um, emphatic about trying to main, manage expectations and let people know that this race um, could not be settled uh, for, you know, uh, potentially a number of days after the polls close. Um, every state in the United States has its own election laws and procedures. Some of them have been changed in some cases uh, very dramatically since the last presidential election. And so, you know, we're definitely looking at a potentially days long period after polls close where we don't know for sure uh, who has won this election election, given how close we expect it to be. Realistically, at Washington Post, what are you expecting as to when the results could be clear and it would be possible to project a winner? Yeah, I mean, I would just reiterate um, what I just said. I mean, we do, at the you know post, we don't have an official <laughs> official estimate of when the race will be called. But I think in the broader political and media world, um, you know, there is an expectation that it could take a number of days, you know, potentially until the weekend, until media organizations and other uh, official political sources are ready to declare a winner in this race. Right. Uh, what are the issues that we are going to see, uh, Sean? in terms of projecting a winner in this election uh, and from now till the actual swearing in of the new president what are the kind of issues that we could possibly see the scenarios oh i mean there, there are some terrifying scenarios i mean there there are ways it could work out where you end up with a tied electoral college and it's up to the u.s house of representatives to decide of course the u.s Rep house of representatives is expected to be closely contested in this election as well um, Realistically, though, um, it's likely some of these states are going to go down to recounts. Um, there's going to be ballot challenges. As mentioned, both sides uh, have more than capable attorneys uh, set up to contest things. So it's entirely possible that, that we won't know the answer to this question maybe until January 6, when the actual um, electoral college votes are canceled. But we also shouldn't discount the possibility that although the polls do point to a close race, if there's a slight break one way or the other, this whole thing could be wrapped up uh, surprisingly short. We just don't know. Expect, expect the worst and you'll be pleasantly surprised when you get the best. Right. Uh, Meena Shankar, what do you feel about the possibility of a setback to some of the progress that we've made 
in the India-US relationship on things such as the Indo-Pacific, on things such as semiconductors, ISET, uh, vis-a-vis China and supply chains here in India. Do you think if Trump were to win tomorrow, we could see a setback, a transactional president who would want to know that if we are making jet engines in India in collaboration with an Indian company, then what is U.S. getting in return? Look, I think that uh, the U.S. policy of building the strategic relationship with India enjoys consensus across uh, Democratic and Republican administration. So that would be, there would be broad continuity in the relationship. Uh, also, the policy of uh, hedging their bets on China and diversifying, uh, de-risking will continue. So the US and other Western countries will pursue a policy of China plus one, but that plus one could be spread over a number of countries, including India. Having said this, I think there is a question mark because Trump has uh, always taken a nationalistic protectionist position on sharing of technology or joint production overseas. Uh, it's not that he could pull back from all of it, but it puts a question mark on how vigorously some of these initiatives will be pursued because uh, I think the GEF 414 deal will probably go ahead because G stands to gain a lot um, in terms of the Mark II aircraft, which it will power in India. So it's a long-term uh, relationship that is being entered into. On ISET, the Initiative on Critical and Emerging Technologies, which is more amorphous, I think um, perhaps we may not see the same kind of enthusiasm. But let's not forget that businesses in America and research institutions and universities, you know, they have their own uh, momentum as well. So some of mm. it continue because I think India is the inevitable high tech partner in many sectors and it helps to build US competitiveness as well. Right. Uh, let me uh, take the final set of questions with our panelists. Uh, uh, Sean, if I were to ask you about the final seven swing states, what are some of the issues which will finally decide the election today in the seven swing states, according to you, Sean? Well, I think uh, we've covered a lot of them. Obviously, abortion rights is a big deal in many of these states, although some of the swing states like Wisconsin and Michigan have constitutionalized the right to an abortion. So perhaps it's not as uh, big of a deal there. In Nevada and Arizona, on the other hand, there are initiatives on the ballot uh, to constitutionalize that right, which you know could drive Democratic turnout. There's also unease in America about the state of the economy, um, although uh, there have been issues, you know, the, the uh, unemployment is low, the jobs reports have been good, growth has been solid. We went through a serious bout of inflation, and Americans are cranky about that, um, rightly or wrongly. Uh, we have always seen the economy being a major driver of election returns, so this could just end up being plain and simple, a referendum. Uh, on how the Biden administration handled uh, the inflation that we had uh, in the, the 2022 and 2023. Right, and a quick verdict, Sean. Uh, where do you think the scales are tilted right now? Who has the advantage? Just a brief verdict. <laughs> oh, gosh, it, it is close. Um, I might put a thumb on the scale for Trump, but nothing would surprise me in terms of the outcome. All right. Patrick, what about you? Who do you think uh, has an advantage right now? <laughs> Unfortunately, in this in this position, I can't make predictions. But as we discussed, it's, it's razor thin uh, in some of these states. OK, uh, Mira Shankar, I'm sure you're in a position to give us your prediction. Uh, what's, what's your view? Is it advantage Kamala Harris? If the Americans don't know, I sitting in India thousands of miles certainly don't know. We are all as confused as America. 
All right. Uh, so let's see what happens in the next couple of hours. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, Ambassador Meera Shankar, Sean Trent for joining us on the program. We will be continuing our coverage of the U.S. elections. Keep tuning in to CNBC TV 18.